In the name of Jesus, dear Christian friends, amen. Jesus is a good guy, isn't he? Yeah, he's a pretty good guy. I mean, he knows when to be tender, and he knows when to be strong. He knows when he needs to come down hard on somebody, but he also knows how to build someone up. We've been hearing, if you've been paying attention the last few weeks, you've been hearing about some of Jesus' miracles lately, uh, feeding 5,000 people, walking on water. He, though he did more, we haven't seen Jesus take one misstep. All in all, Jesus is a really good guy. Of course, his miracles show that he's more than just a guy, a regular Joe. His miracles were evidence, evidence of his divine power, his divine authority over all creation. Those miracles show that as God is in the flesh in Jesus, he is both willing and completely able to help those who know they are in need. As I said, Jesus is just a really good guy. Today's miracle in the Gospel reading is a spectacular addition. Mom asks Jesus to heal her daughter. Her daughter was possessed by a demon. By the end of the reading, Jesus has had mercy and the daughter is healed from that very hour. Jesus is a good guy. Never makes a misstep. He always gives it to you. But what do you do in between there with this Jesus who tells a begging woman, a woman who's on her knees, that she is a dog and not worth his time? I quote, But she came and knelt before Jesus, saying, Lord, help me! And he answered, <clears throat> It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. He just called her a dog. He's implying that she is beneath him. I hope, if you're really paying attention, that you find this, this conversation a little bit troubling. Imagine you're the mom. You're the parent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your daughter is sick, really sick. So sick you discover she's possessed by a demon. You would do anything, and I mean anything, to get her some help. In fact, you've probably tried just about everything you can think of. So finally, you hear about this guy, this really good guy. So you seek him out. You look for this Jesus. You've heard that he, some strange and wonderful stories about this guy. He's a really good guy. He's a great healer. He has, <coughs> excuse me, divine power. He's got divine compassion for people. So you seek him out because you don't know where else to go. But you know you need somebody who has divine power to heal your daughter. Now, the text doesn't tell us how endless and hopeless or quick and painless this search for Jesus was, only that she finally got close enough to him, and when she did, she cried out for mercy. And that's where things become a little troubling. It's troubling because Jesus says and does, and in fact starts out by not saying some things that we simply don't understand, and if we're honest... We just don't like. She cries out to Jesus and his disciples, and he responds. It says, he did not answer her a word. Not a word. Didn't say a thing. <laughs> you ever been in the store, and you need some help? <clears throat> so you go to the clerk behind the counter, and you ask. And they appear to see and hear you, but the clerk just simply doesn't respond. They ignore you. It's not only rude, it's, it's downright disrespectful, and it's plainly infuriating. It's how Jesus responds to this woman. She cries for mercy, and he doesn't utter a single word. 
Now, the disciples weren't, frankly, much better. They acknowledge her existence, but they beg Jesus repeatedly to send her away, even if it means giving her something, just to shut her up. And here I thought Jesus was a good guy. Just doesn't sound like it. Maybe I'm missing something. I mean, after all, the disciples, we all know, can goof things up. They do repeatedly in the Gospels, constantly goofing things up. And yet we hear Jesus say, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Ouch. But hang on, the story gets more twisted. It gets worse. Yes, folks, the woman agrees. Who saw that coming? The woman doesn't lose her cool, she doesn't fight for her own position, and she doesn't unloose her own emotional stress, which I'm certain she was under. She simply agrees. Yes, Lord, for even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Does Jesus really love all people or not? Does this woman suffer from extremely low (laughs) self-esteem? Are we free to treat those who are outside the faith as dogs? What really is going on? I want you to learn a term today, and I'm going to have you repeat it after me. It describes the way that God has decided to interact with his creation. We call it the scandal of particularity. Say that with me. The scandal of particularity. It's a fancy word or phrase. Uh, Another way that some people say it, they say it this way. How odd of God to choose the Jews. How odd of God to choose the Jews. (laughs) The scandal of particularity summarizes God's work in the world. That God would choose to work through a particular person in a specific family, at a specific location, through a particular time period in our history. That is why it's particular. It's so exact, precise, where God would work for all people. It's a scandal because we have our own expectations about how God will act. And sometimes the way he does offends us. Now, none of us good Lutherans here today are going to actually admit that. But if we're honest in our hearts, we don't like it. Most of us enlightened 21st century Americans have a certain set of expectations about God and how he is. We generally all agree that God is love and that God loves us. Most would probably buy into the fact that God is sort of all-powerful, or at least has great power, and that he can do the things he wants to do. And almost everyone in our culture assumes, if they will uh, believe in a God or acknowledge one, that this God will always hear our prayers and answer us and help us in our need. So put these together, and what do you get? The American expectation of God is a powerful, loving God who loves us the way we want to be loved. As long as he keeps with the program, we're happy to praise his name, worship him, and maybe uh, throw a few bucks in the offering plate, too. But when he doesn't, when he doesn't meet our expectations, when he doesn't work the way we want him to, when he doesn't say the things we want to hear, well, then there's something wrong with him. So we ask all sorts of really good questions, like, why doesn't God do this for me? Or, how could a loving God allow this thing to happen? Or, why did God allow this evil to become my problem? When God doesn't follow our expectations, we become offended with him. And in some cases, that offense is so great that many just lose faith. 
This is the air we're breathing, folks. It's all around us. It's in our media. It's on TV and in our movies. It's even in the politicians and the things that are decided among us. This is the culture we are seeped in. And because it is so much a part of life around us, these assumptions about God, it's really hard for us to understand how this woman could put up with Jesus. How rude and disrespectful. In fact, if she's not offended, then maybe we'll be offended for her. If she's not infuriated, then doggone it, I will be. If she's not willing to question Jesus, then we should. And that is the crux of the narrative. You see, she was not. She understood something about God that we easily miss. She understood the scandal of particularity. You see, this woman was a Canaanite. She was a pagan. Tyre and Sidon, the cities that she was near, are not in Israel. They're not believing people. In fact, Tyre and Sidon in the Old Testament are already known to be completely wicked and evil. Nothing had changed. This woman has no family ties to Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. She wasn't a part of the covenant family of God, and she knew it. She knew she had no right to ask Jesus for help. She had nothing to offer. She knew the truth, and that is why she isn't plainly offended. And that's why Jesus shouldn't offend us either. You see, we too stand outside of the original family of God. I don't think any of you have any biological connections to Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, do you? I don't. We are Gentiles, foreigners, strangers and sinful ones at that. What do you think Paul was addressing in our reading from Romans 11? He's talking about the Jews as God's chosen people, and where do Gentiles fit? On our own, we have nothing and no right to ask God for anything. But Paul reminds us we're not on our own. Something amazing happens with Jesus. Paul says we are grafted in to the family. Through Jesus, in death and resurrection, his on a torment, uh, an instrument of torment, and our death and resurrection through water and the word at a font, even when we were infants, Through these things, we have been brought into the family of God. We are grafted into the family. What's more, he has invited us, even commanded us, to come to him with every prayer, fervently in every need. Jesus casts out the demons of my life and yours. He removes our sinful expectations our personal grudges, our selfish motives, and even our failures to act. Just as we began the service hearing that Christ in his death and resurrection forgives you all your sins, that means as far as the east is from the west, those things are gone. He removed them from you. They are no longer in sight. He has defeated the devil and all his minions He has freed you from yourself to live in love even as you are loved in him. It's crazy, isn't it? If you've been watching the last few weeks in the Gospels, you've seen Jesus perform some mighty acts. And there seems to be a theme that's arising. You see, Jesus feeds 5,000 people, but first he asks the disciples to give them something to eat, something which they could never have done. And then he provides everything. Jesus walks on water. 
Then he invites Peter to do it, and Peter steps out on the water too, something he should not be able to do. But when Peter loses faith and begins to sink, Jesus reaches down and saves him. Here we have uh, Jesus being petitioned by a woman to heal her daughter, a woman who has no rights or obligations or authority or anything before Jesus, and he treats her like part of the family. We are completely out of our league when it comes to Jesus. We're completely dependent on his mercy, Jew or Gentile, member of Good Shepherd or stranger among us. We come with empty hands, totally dependent on the mercy of God, with nothing to offer but our greatest needs. And our Lord is full of compassion for a crowd, for Peter, for a Canaanite woman, for you and me. Lord, help me, we cry. And the Lord provides. Jesus really is a good guy. You can count on it. In the name of Christ, amen. I invite you to stand.